Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bjork of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a first time guest, but I've been following his work for years. He's worked in the financial industry for over two decades, including at Lehman Brothers. He wrote an awesome book detailing his experiences there and the collapse of Lehman Brothers. If you want to go buy that on Audible audiobook, he's actually here to talk about his new book, which is No Worries, How to Live a Stress-Free Financial Life. His main job, though, right now is he's the editor of the Daily Dirt Nap, a daily market newsletter for investment professionals and also retail investors. Jared Dillian, thank you for joining me. Yo, thanks for having me. This is going to be good. So, Jared, we're recording this interview on Wednesday, January 31st, 2024. Instead of talking about the markets, I want to talk about personal finance because there's all these crazy narratives going on about like the gig economy, artificial intelligence, uh, high interest rates for the consumer and small business owner, uh, currency debasement. And I think your book is like the perfect time for this because I was watching your other interviews and you're talking about debt and risk. So what were the goals for writing your new book? What were you trying to accomplish by getting your book out there right now? Well, first of all, let me say that you know, there's such a thing as big personal finance. You know, we have a personal finance industry in this company, uh, country, and, um, there's a few big players. You have Susie Orman and Dave Ramsey and Robert Kiyosaki, and they all kind of have different views on things. And I don't know what your opinion is on these people, but I think they're a bunch of ding dongs. And every once in a while they end up in the news because they say something just completely out of touch and stupid. Um, and they generally give bad advice. Um, so, you know, this was like 2018 and I was kind of looking at the state of personal finance and I'm like, there really is a need for a smart personal finance book. Um, something that doesn't preach extreme solutions because that's what these people do. You know, I mean, that you have these extreme solutions like never buy coffee or cut up all your credit cards and live off the grid or buy 20 rental houses and sell them out like this people sell extreme solutions because they're easy to sell and they're easy to understand and really personal finance is a lot more nuanced it's this big linear optimization problem with a lot of different variables and a lot of times in personal finance, the answer is kind of the middle ground. You know, um, I spend a lot of time in the book talking about two different types of people, uh, people who spend too much. They're the high rollers and people who spend too little. They're the CFs. And the goal is to have to be in the middle and to have a healthy relationship with money, which not a lot of people do. So you brought up some personal finance experts and a, a lot of that stuff's marketing. I mean, like, I don't want to pick on people too much, but I mean, Dave Ramsey, like his main narratives are what get out of debt. And then a lot of these personal finance gurus, once they get to a certain level, like on their social media platform or on TV, it just becomes, and you worked in the financial industry, it just becomes, it seems to me, commission and market sales. So he's directing people to mutual funds. He's directing people to index funds. He's telling people, don't buy this, don't buy that. Oh, you have to buy mutual funds. Oh, you have to buy index funds. And then it just becomes all about marketing and commissions for a lot of these personal finance gurus then. Yeah. And and look, I mean, to be candid, you know, Dave Ramsey, I want to say makes like 30 million a year and he's worth a couple hundred million and he's been very successful. And um you know, he sort of built this empire down in Nashville um, and look like I would like to build a business around my ideas. I would like to be equally successful. Um, a lot of the things he does is, um, you know, whether it's real estate or timeshares or mutual funds, you know, he's pushing people into financial products that, you know, he ultimately benefits from. Uh, and I guess that's fine. Um, with regard to the mutual funds, um, you know, in particular, he he thinks that everybody should be in growth stock mutual funds. It's actually what he calls it, growth stock hyphenated, growth stock mutual funds. And he says that people should be in these funds because they return the most, which is the most simplistic view on markets I think I've ever heard in my entire life that you should buy an asset because it returns the most. Well, if you buy an asset because it returns the most, probably also has a lot of risk, right? And you know, the stock market, even even the S&P 500 is pretty risky. Um it's, you know, the S&P 500 has drawdowns of 50%. The S&P 500 moves around 15 to 20% a year. 
and he's taking his clients who are not very well off and not very sophisticated and pushing them into tech stocks, uh, which can sometimes have drawdowns of 80%. Um, so I think that he doesn't really have a concept of suitability. Um, you know, the, the types of financial products that are suitable for his followers. Um, and he just has a really simplistic view of capital markets and, you know, me with a career on wall street and working on wall street for 24 years, like I actually have an understanding of risk. So I think that's one of the main differences. Yeah. He's not talking about how asset valuations can change and things work in cycles. He's not talking, he's not looking at specific different sectors for undervaluation or anything like that. It seems like he's just promoting the one, the one uh, asset class that grows stocks all the time, which is kind of ridiculous. Well, I mean, look, you know, it has worked for sure. <laughs> well, over just the last for the max seven. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, over the last 20 years, that has definitely worked, but look, it's not going to work forever. Absolutely not. Like there's going to be a regime change in the markets. Uh, valuation will matter. It's it's only a matter of time. Maybe it's, look, maybe it's 10 years from now, but someday it's going to matter and gross stocks will not be the place to be and his strategy will massively underperform. In the book, I talk about something that I invented called the awesome portfolio. And the awesome portfolio is a mixture of five asset classes, stocks, bonds, cash, gold, and real estate. And the interesting thing about this portfolio, and he, he rebounds it once a year. If the interesting thing about this portfolio is that you don't trade off much in the way of returns. You only trade off about 1% in returns, but you massively reduce your risk. It has half the volatility of an 80-20 portfolio, and the max drawdown in any given year has been 12%. So you think about it, you're like, look, the conventional wisdom is everybody should invest in the S&P 500. Uh, the S&P 500 returns 9% a year and it has a volatility of X. And if you invest in an index, not only do you get the returns of the index, you get the volatility of the index, which is a lot. You know, So even if over the course of your investing career, you had the ability to ride out the ups and downs, the question is, do you really want to do that? Because you know, over the course of a 40-year investing career, you're going to have one 50% drawdown. You're going to have a couple 30% drawdowns. You're going to have 20% drawdowns, and it's going to cause you a lot of stress. And that's really what the book is about, is financial stress. And that's why I created this portfolio, which greatly reduces your risk and reduces your stress and increases the probability that you can stay invested and keep compounding over time. So your portfolio is a lot different than the one that Wall Street is recommending now, which is modern portfolio theory, which is generally like 60, 40 stocks and bonds. I mean, a lot of those bond fund managers last two or three years, as the Fed was raising interest rates, they had enormous losses. And there was a lot of people that were over leveraged bonds. Yeah, I mean, you know, I talk about the 60, 40 portfolio in the book. And one of the flaws of the 60, there's, there's a couple flaws. Um, one is that if you invest in stocks and bonds, you are not diversified because you only have financial assets. You don't have real assets. In order to be truly diversified, you need real assets. You need things like gold and commodities and real estate and stuff like that. And the good news is, is that, you know, in 2024, there's all kinds of ETFs and financial products that make it really easy to invest in those things. Okay. The other thing is, is that stocks and bonds, as we learned in the last couple of years, are not always negatively correlated. They have been for long periods of time, but they're not now. They're actually positively correlated. And that actually doesn't reduce your risk. It actually amplifies your risk. Your portfolio is actually similar to the Harry Brown permanent portfolio. I don't know if you've ever studied that. So he was actually similar stocks, uh, real estate, bonds, and some gold. And I think no, some cash. actually he was um, the permanent portfolio is stocks, gold, bonds, and cash. And I added real estate. Um, and the interesting thing about real estate is that it gives you a little additional exposure to inflation. So it tends to do well during inflationary periods. Um, and it also gives you some ex more exposure to hard assets and it actually has some risk reducing properties. So, you know, I, I back tested these portfolios. I looked at the permanent portfolio. I added real estate and it, it, uh, it, 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 you have more risk reduction with real estate.
That's really good. So I want to ask you then about debt, because for personal finance with inflation, higher cost of living now, the price of home prices, rents are going up. Is there a way to avoid debt or do people just have to manage debt then? You can't completely avoid debt. And getting back to Dave Ramsey, that's what he advises you to do is to completely avoid debt, cut up your credit cards and all that stuff. Um, you know, debt allows you to accomplish certain things. Very hard to buy a house without debt. Cars are expensive now. Very hard to buy a car without debt. The goal is to minimize it and keep it at manageable levels. Okay. Uh, and that's really what the, that's really what it's about. Like debt is a source of financial stress for a lot of people. A lot of people lay up at night and they're kind of wondering how they're going to pay the credit card bills, how they're going to pay the mortgage. And if you have debt, you have stress. So the goal is to keep it at a minimum. Especially in a recession, if people are potentially either going to lose their jobs or they're tapping into their savings because there's more currency debasement or monetary inflation. So I, I think that's it, it's debt relative to income. I think that's the key. It's not just total debt levels. It's cash flow, your monthly income. Yeah, and that's you, 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 the big, the number one place where people get into trouble with that is student loans, um, where you have somebody that goes to an expensive grad school or a third tier law school or something like that, and they have one hundred and fifty or two hundred thousand in student debt, and they're making forty thousand a year after graduation, and the math just doesn't add up. Or they vote for the politician that promises them a bailout to, to eliminate their student loan debt. <laughs> <laughs> I actually talk about that in the book also. <laughs> uh, that seemed unfortunate. I'm using air quotes here for a solution. It's not a real solution. I mean, like we're going to, I think it's still being fought in the courts. I know they've been trying to bail out some of the student loan debt, but I know it's tied up in the courts too. Well, what happened was the Supreme Court re ruled against debt forgiveness so the government stuck, but what they've done is they've greatly expanded the PSLF, the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program, which was kind of an orphan in the government for a number of years. There, there were very few people getting their loans forgiven under this program, but they've greatly expanded it in the last few months. And I want to say they've forgiven about $140 billion in student loans under the PSLF uh, and related programs just recently. So one of the keys to personal finance, in my opinion, is through your income and hard work, you start developing savings or uh, capital formation. So it's like old school economics, personal finance 101. You have to have capital first. You have to save. You have to produce more than you consume, save the difference. And then that's how you build wealth over time, or at least it used to be. Um, and then you learn how to invest from your savings. Uh, how difficult is it going to be to save and develop capital in this type of environment with uh, currency debasement and debt? all over the place. Well, one of the things I talk about in the book, I have a chapter in the book called the revenue side. And the revenue side is the idea that the most elegant solution to not having enough money is to actually make more money. And that's something the personal finance experts don't talk about. They say you're constrained. Okay. You make $60,000 a year. That's how much you make. You're constrained by that. So therefore, you have to cut expenses as aggressively as possible in order to save a certain amount to invest. Well, there is another approach. Like it, you have this pie, and instead of slicing and dicing the pie into a million little pieces, why not just make another pie, right? Why don't Why don't you go out and get a second job or start a business or do passive income or something in order to make more money? And I can tell you that Making more money is a lot more fun than cutting expenses, which is miserable. So getting back to your original point about producing more than you consume, I really, in the book, I really focus more on the production side, you know, because there's really a limited amount you can do in cutting expenses. And, you know, I, it's my observation that people in this country are already pretty good with money. They're already pretty frugal. Most people and there's just not much you can do on the expense side. So you have to focus on the revenue side. Yeah, I agree. Especially if you're married and you start cutting expenses like that. I mean, like you're going to make your life miserable. You're looking at divorce. I have friends where that's happened. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I want to ask about some of the trends that are going on now, like artificial intelligence, the gig economy. Do you think it's going to be harder than for people to grow their incomes with these things happening where it looks like a lot of corporations in the either they've already started or in the near future, they're going to start firing 
those mid-level managers, those employees that are making, I don't know, between like 80,000 and 250,000, do you think people are going to have to be more entrepreneurial going forward to execute a good personal finance strategy? Well, the funny thing about this, I mean, you know, everybody can see this coming with AI. We all know it's going to happen. It's going to happen a lot more slowly than people think. I don't think this is really going to be an issue for another 10 years. Um, and it's funny because we had all these debates about universal basic income, you know, back in the 2020 election when Andrew Yang was running. And, you know, the the funny thing about UBI is that it was totally discredited by inflation, but it was an idea that made sense, but was really just like five years early. Like now, and now that AI is here, like UBI actually like has a lot more credence. Um, but I don't think, you know, I think the book is evergreen. Like I think the same general principles apply. And really like what you're talking about is people need to have the ability to scramble and get creative and reinvent themselves it, you know, it, it, in an environment where technology is changing so rapidly, like even, even me personally, I've had to reinvent myself a couple of times. You know, I went to a military academy. I, I served in the military for nine years and then I reinvented myself as a trader and I was a trader for nine years. And then I reinvented myself as a writer and I've been a writer ever since. And maybe I'm going to do something different, you know, like the idea that you would live in a town and work at the factory for 40 years and retire and never move. Like that's a very 1950s idea and that doesn't exist anymore. It's a very dynamic economy. So people really need to reinvent themselves more than once over their lifetime in order to stay competitive. Yeah, I totally agree. Also back then, not only was there job security, a lot of those factories, there was also defined benefit pension plan. So basically, if you worked a certain number of years, you were getting a guaranteed retirement when you were ready to stop working at the factory. Those days are over. Yep. Yep. Now, like you have to allocate your own retirement funds. I mean, Wall Street's taking a large cut of that. You don't have a lot of options in your what normal 401k retirement plan. Anyway, Wall Street gives you what a, a few stock mutual funds or an index fund and a bond fund. Yeah, that's a whole separate discussion. Um, you know, the funny thing is, is that 50% of retirement assets has now moved to target date funds. And that's both a positive and a negative development. Um, the positive development is they're simple. They're easy to understand. They handle the asset allocation for you. Uh, it's not like 25 years ago where you had all these different sector funds and stuff and people were doing their own asset allocation. Like it's really one-stop shopping and it's simple and people can stick to it. That's, that's the good thing about target date funds. The bad thing is, like you said, it's really limited people's investment choices. So, you know, a lot of the more exotic stuff that you might be able to invest in is just not available to you in your 401k plan. And also, I would argue, I, I'm in the Mike Green camp. I think it's created an index fund bubble. I think it's going into that market cap weighted index fund. And that's why one of the reasons why the uh, index fund has just kept going up and up in the MAG7, because the, the market caps, the higher market caps, just keep getting more capital allocated from their retirement funds. Yeah, I'm very familiar with his argument about that. And I agree with it to a large extent. Uh, I don't know if Mike Green has a solution as to what would stop it. I don't really have an answer to that. You know, in 1997, index funds had 1% of AUM. Now they have 56%. In Japan, it's over 70%. Like, I don't, I don't see what reverses this trend. Yeah, I agree. They were never meant to get this big, but now they're too big. <laughs> yeah. So I want to ask you about the gig economy. Uh, the gig economy, do you think it's going to be producing a lot uh, less job security and lower paying jobs? So then people are going to have to take advice to your book. They're going to have to be creative because there's not going to be those higher paying six figure jobs as much job security going forward. Uh, I don't know that I have a really strong view. I mean, look, like when people talk about the gig economy, it almost has like a negative connotation and people think. Like it's, you know, it's, it's being a DoorDash driver and stuff like that. And it's, it's really low, it's low paying stuff. And you're kind of scratching by like the gig economy that doesn't necessarily have to be like that. Like there's people in the gig economy that make multiple six figures or seven figures, you know? So, I mean, including me, I mean, you might even say that like, I'm part of the gig economy. Like I have the daily dirt nap and I've been doing it for 16 years and, you know, like it's, it's not a side hustle, but it's my job. 
But ultimately, like I, you know, I'm an entrepreneur and I created something and it makes a lot of money. So. Well, maybe you start off as this. So you started it off maybe as a side hustle or a side gig, but then you developed it as an entrepreneur into what a successful small business. I mean, most people don't achieve that type of success, though. Yeah. So I want to get to the the risk part then. So it, it sounds like not only do people have to learn to manage debt, they have to learn how to manage risk. So you think going forward, people are going to have to take more risks then to get good investment returns and to maintain or grow their income? No, not necessarily. I mean, it, th that totally contradicts what I said earlier about the awesome portfolio. I think you can trade a little bit away in the, in, in, in the way of returns and dramatically reduce your risk and increase your peace of mind. I mean, that's really the goal here. Like, I, there's, I think people, you know, the funny thing is, is that in, in bull markets, people's return assumptions go up and in bear markets, people's return assumptions go down. And I think if you asked the average person on the street today, what the S and P 500 returns every year, they'd probably say like 12 to 15%. I think if you asked them in October of 2022, they would probably say like six or 8%. So it's kind of this moving target. And people generally overestimate what the returns of the stock market are going to be. And also, like, I'm in the camp where I'm one of these people who believe that we are in a lost decade of stock returns. I think returns are basically going to be zero low single digits over the next 10 years. You know, and we've had periods like this in the past from 1969 to 1982, from 1929 to 1945 or six. Like, I, I think. I think we're going to have very, because of valuations, we're going to have very low returns over the next 10 years. Not only that, also the size of the government debt and how much taxes are going going to go up. The time periods you described were either the 1970s stagflation or post-World War II when the government, U.S. federal government was doing what? Financial repression and inflating away the war debt. Yep. Yep. So in your opinion, what are the largest personal finance mistakes that people should pay attention to and try to avoid? The largest personal finance mistakes, um, it really comes down to your attitude towards money, right? And that's that's the first couple chapters of the book, your attitudes towards money. And a lot of people think that money is like this static quantity and they make $60,000 a year and that's what they make and they can't make any more. The, really, the first couple sentences of the book say that if you if you want money, you have to want money. You actually have to want more money. And I talk about how there's actually a, lo a lot of people in the country that don't want more money. It's not that they're necessarily happy or satisfied with what they have. It's that they don't really see any options as to how they could make more money, but the options are right in front of them. Just for just as an example, this is what I talked about in the book. If you become a teacher, you love children, you like teaching, it's what you want to do, it's a very highly respected profession, but you are deciding to make less money on purpose, right? You're deciding to make less money on purpose. This is a choice. And this is what I talk about in the book. Money is a choice. If money was important to you, then you would do something else. You would change careers and maybe you would be a real estate agent and make $100,000 a year. But you, but you made a conscious choice. You like working with kids. It's a respected profession. And that is, that is what you do. So money is a choice. Or, I mean, I guess people in the long term, they could come up with some type of plan, right? Where they have some type of side hustle where you were doing a transition from your Wall Street job to your uh, entrepreneurial job, your side hustle, and then building into a small business. So someone on the weekends could, I don't know, they could do, they're good at baking or making food. They can develop a catering business. I mean, I've heard Cases where teachers, they took their, uh, on the weekends, they were doing what catering jobs and baking jobs, and that turned into a business eventually. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think the bottom line is because of the environment that I see going forward with currency debasement, all these governments, and then higher taxes, I think people are just going to have to be more entrepreneurial to either maintain their standard of living or grow their income. I think, unfortunately, that's the new normal. Yep, I agree. With these Fed rate hikes, do you think eventually that they're going to break the economy if the Fed doesn't cut rates? Uh, sure doesn't seem like it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the funny thing is, is that the stock market is not only higher 
than when we started raising rates. It's actually a lot higher. It's like 10 or 15% higher than when we started raising rates, which I think nobody would have predicted. I mean, we had a big drawdown in between, but like I, you know, with Fed funds at five and a half, I would not have predicted that the S and P is at forty nine hundred. Like I never would have thought that in a million years. Um, and the data is pretty good. You know, I mean, we had a manufacturing recession, which we seem to be coming out of. Um, and you know, the consumer confidence numbers are going up, and the labor market just never had a downtick. Like. Gosh, you know, and I think if you're the Fed and we can we can talk about today's Fed meeting if you want. But I think if you're the Fed and you're looking at this and you say, well, gee whiz, you know, the economy seems to be tolerating five and a half percent Fed funds pretty well. Why not just leave it there? You know, there's really you know, there there was this argument four months ago or three months ago that we had excessively tightened that monetary policy was restrictive and we should remove some of that restrictiveness. And that, I mean, just looking at the data over the last month, that argument is like totally dissolved. There are some warnings. I mean, there the last two months, there's been three bank CEOs, Jamie Dimon at JP Morgan, the Bank of America CEO, CEO Cantor Fitzgerald. I mean, they are giving warnings that things are not as rosy as they seem. So the asset markets are, but we're seeing all these mass firings from companies. So there are problems coming down the pipe, but not in, the asset markets don't reflect that, I would say. No, not at all. Yeah. Well, more Fed, more Fed distortions, more government distortions. What the, the government selling went around a trillion dollars of new debt every couple of months. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the debt is the debt is a long conversation. I just pretend there was a presidential candidate that committed to getting the deficit under 3% of GDP and hold it there for eight years. Like there is a possibility that we could grow our way out of the debt. I mean, we did it after World War II. Like it's it's possible to grow our way out of the debt, but not when the deficit is at eight, nine, ten percent of GDP and expanding. So now for your portfolio recommendation in your book, do you have a separate website or is that handled through your newsletter? What do you mean? Uh, the portfolio, the diversified portfolio in your book is just laid out in the book. You don't have a website that shows like step by step how to do it. So, so yes. Well, I mean, you could, you could read the book and implement it yourself. There, there's nothing really, um, there's nothing really fancy about it. Uh, it's called the awesome portfolio, uh, at my website is jareddillionmoney.com. There is a document that I sell. I think it's, $99 or $129, which really dives deep into the history and the data and the charts behind the awesome portfolio and goes into a little more detail about how to implement it. Excellent. And I'll attach links to your audiobook and also your hardcover and Kindle. It's on Amazon for our listeners who want to go buy it. Thank you for your time, Jared. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. This was great.